to it. And, and you're talking team. about what your foreign minister calls the B team, Bolton, Bin Salman, Bibi Netanyahu. That's what you're saying now, right? That is a very real scenario that you're facing. So here now is what a very influential Republican senator says, Tom Cotton, about the consequences of all of this. Yes. Unprovoked attacks on commercial shipping warrant a retaliatory military strike against the Islamic Republic of Iran. Going back to President Washington and all the way down to President Trump, the fastest way to get the fire and fury of the U.S. military unleashed on you is to interfere with the freedom of navigation on the open seas and in the air. That's exactly what Iran is doing and one of the world's most important strategic choke points. The president has the authorization to act to defend American interests. Navy confirms it's aware of a suspected torpedo attack on several oil tankers, and the Fifth Fleet is responding. This happened about 25 miles off the Iranian coastline in a stretch of water that separates Oman and the UAE from Iran. U.S. ships are rendering assistance right now to dozens of sailors who had to be rescued after the incident uh, when sailors abandoned ship. This is only the latest in a series of attacks instigated by the Islamic Republic of Iran and its surrogates against American and allied interests. Meanwhile, Japanese Prime Minister Shinzo Abe is in Iran right now in a visit widely believed to be an attempt to ease the tensions between the U.S. and Tehran. During a joint press conference earlier today, President Hassan Rouhani said Iran would crush its enemies if they're attacked ever by the U.S. Supreme Leader Ayatollah Khamenei today told Abe that Iran would not again negotiate with America and he doesn't even want to send me a message to Trump through an intermediary. In reference to what you have said that has come from U.S. President Donald Trump, I must say that I do not have an answer in response to the message from Trump. I will share some topics with you, but I am not going to send a message to him because Trump is not someone who is worthy of an exchange of messages. This is the Strait of Hormuz. It's one of the most important and strategic waterways in the world. And why is it so important? Let me explain. The Strait links the Middle East's crude oil producers to key markets in Asia, Europe, North America, and beyond. On one side, we have the Arab states, including a number of key US allies in the region. And on the other side, Iran. At its narrowest point, it separates Oman and Iran by just 21 miles. It has two shipping lanes, each just two miles wide. It may be narrow, but the Strait of Hormuz is deep enough and wide enough to handle the world's largest crude oil tankers. In total, 
a fifth of the world's oil exports are squeezed through this tiny corridor. That's almost 19 million barrels of oil every day. Compared to 16 million barrels shipped through the Strait of Malacca, or 5.5 million through the nearby Suez Canal each day, making Hormoz the most important oil choke point in the world. The Strait is also the main route for Iranian oil exports. And this is a big deal for Iran's economy. Oil makes up around two-thirds of Iranian exports. That was $66 billion in 2017. Iran, understandably, isn't happy about a ban on its oil sales. But it holds a trump card. Bidonat. اگر روزی بخواهد جلو نفت ایران را بگیرد نفتی از خلیج فارس صادر نخواهد شد Iran's threat to stop oil leaving through the strait could basically mean making it unsafe It could mean the deployment of sea mines submarines anti-ship missiles or fast attack boats to close down the route and there are a few reasons why this matters. Firstly, any instability in oil routes means higher oil prices across the world, having huge effects on any industry dependent on oil. One tangible example could be your car's petrol price, 70% of which is dependent on the price of crude oil. But more importantly, Shutting the strait could be considered an act of war by the international community, something both the US and Iran say they want to avoid. We do not seek escalation, but uh, we have always given that ourselves. Mr. President, are we going to war with Iran? But a simple mistake or miscalculation could have major and unpredictable consequences, and many are raising the question, could these tensions escalate to a point of no return. Breaking news, Robin, this morning. And we want to get right to that, David. The U.S. confirming Iran shot down an American drone. Our chief global affairs correspondent, Martha Raddatz, starts us off with the latest. Good morning, Martha. Good morning, Robin. This is a significant and dangerous provocation. There have been a spate of attacks blamed on Iran in recent weeks, but this is a direct attack on a U.S. military asset. Iran does not deny shooting down the U.S. aircraft, but claims it was in Iranian territorial airspace. President Trump saying today that the American people will soon find out if the United States is going to war with Iran, saying the regime made a very big mistake shooting down a U.S. military surveillance drone like the one you see on your screen at 4.05 a.m. Iranian time over the Strait of Hormuz. Barbara, what type of military options is the Pentagon considering? Well, Jake, right now the Pentagon has been focused on defense and deterrence against Iran, but at this hour, all of that could change. Murky new video released by the Pentagon of a U.S. Navy drone being shot down by an Iranian surface-to-air missile may be the moment that changes everything. It's hard to make out, but the smoke plume is visible as the drone falls into the waters of the Strait of Hormuz. This map showing the missile launched from the Iranian coastline more than 20 miles away from the drone, according to the Pentagon. Iran's Revolutionary Guard releasing its own video showing what it says is the moment of the shootdown. When asked about a U.S. military response, President Trump playing his cards close to the vest in the initial hours. Now, Iran made a big mistake. Military commanders behind the scenes are not looking for a march to war, but they are not excusing the attack, highlighting the international nature of the Iranian threat. This was an unprovoked attack on a U.S. surveillance asset that had not violated Iranian airspace at any time during its mission. But Iran claims the American drone was in Iranian airspace and had its own dire warning. We have no intention to fight with any countries, but we are completely ready for war. 
What happened today was an obvious sign of this accurate message. Tensions have been rising for weeks. In early May, the Pentagon sent an aircraft carrier strike group, Patriot missile defenses, and fighter jets in the wake of intelligence the U.S. said showed Iran was planning an attack. Then, Iran is believed to have attacked commercial tankers last month and again last week, using mines to leave gaping holes, leading to another 1,000 troops being sent for further deterrence of Iran. Thanks for joining us. Now, we've just heard the Revolutionary Guard say the shooting down of this drone has sent a clear message to the U.S. Can you tell us what that message is? Uh, we have indeed. This was the head of Iran's Revolutionary Guard, Major General Hossein uh, Salami, who said that Iran's borders were a red line in today's shooting. Uh, shooting down of the U.S. drone uh, was a message to the U.S. that any aggression would result in a crushing response uh, by Iran. I'm not looking for war. And if there is, it'll be obliteration like you've never seen before. Donald Trump has balked at an airstrike for fear of inflicting casualties. They shot down an unmanned uh, drone, mm -hmm. plane, whatever you want to call it. And here we are sitting with 150 dead people that would have taken place probably within a half an hour after I said, go ahead. Yeah. And I didn't like it. I didn't think it was, I didn't think it was proportionate. He reportedly authorized a cyber attack instead. His isolationist supporters in Washington have been cheering. The last That's thing exactly the right. American first agenda needs is a stupid, pointless, unnecessary war with Iran. And he knows right. that. Just days after President Trump announced that he'd called off military strikes on Iran with only minutes to spare, came a warning that Washington was not backing down. National Security Advisor John Bolton, who was on a visit to Israel, said Iran's nuclear ambitions and its involvement in many conflicts around the region represented a threat to international peace. Neither Iran nor any other hostile actor should mistake U.S. prudence and discretion for weakness. No one has granted them a hunting license in the Middle East. But although the president canceled the airstrikes, reliable reports say the U.S. launched a cyber attack on Iran designed to cripple its computer systems. Such an attack would target Iran's defense capabilities, such as its missile sites, which succeeded in bringing down the drone, which the Iranians have been proudly displaying. Military sources say a cyber attack would have been prepared to coincide with the airstrikes and once they had been called off, they may have decided to implement the cyber attacks anyway as a warning. The president probably does not want to get involved in some major conflict abroad, but the question here is whether or not his policies will actually get him into a conflict, whether or not he intends it. And that is the main fear. Michael Fuchs is a former Deputy Assistant Secretary of State in the Obama administration. He believes President Trump may not blink twice. What concerns me deeply is that we see a cycle of escalation that sees that neither side, neither Iran nor the United States, feels like it can back down. And then we go tit for tat and we get involved in some sort of unintended or accidental conflict that then spirals out of control. It is quite possible that the American military might take some action against uh, Iranian gunboats, for instance. But I would not expect this to develop into a wider regional conflict because neither the United States nor Iran has an interest in a wider regional conflict. The end game to all of these conversations uh, is always negotiation. Um, whether there's a military conflict that happens first is the question. Taking to Twitter, these are the words of the US President Donald Trump, and the language is strong. If Iran wants to fight, that will be the official end of Iran, he says. Never threaten the United States again. Well, the language with that has been matched by the Iranian foreign minister, who says, I've been goaded by Donald Trump. Iranians have stood tall for millennia. Well, aggressors are all gone. He accuses Donald Trump of genocidal taunts and says, try respect, it works. 
never threaten an Iranian. Well, the president of Iran has said this. Today's situation is not suitable for talks. Our choice is resistance only. This language has been ramping up ever since the Iran nuclear deal uh, had US pull out in May 2018. And we had questions like this. We need win-win conditions. That's what the president said. Um, we have to face our actions. Otherwise, there'll be consequences. Now, since then, uh, we've seen response from, example, the UK. Um, we've had um, here speaking, uh, we've got Jeremy Hunt, the UK foreign minister, who says, I would say to the Iranians, do not underestimate the result of the US side in this situation. And the US side has actually split Republicans and Democrats. Bernie Sanders has said, Donald Trump, you're being a bully. You're threatening to take us into another war. Who actually will be the consequences of that? It will be our kids and grandkids. No war with Iran. Iran would be annihilated in a sort of direct conflict with, uh, uh, with the United States. Um, they know that, the Americans know that. Iran has been the punching bag of literally every administration uh, since 1979. Since the Iranian Revolution in 1979, the Islamic regime has cast America as its eternal enemy, the Great Satan. After the September 11 attacks on New York, America nominated Iran as one of its most dangerous threats. States like these and their terrorist allies constitute an axis of evil, arming to threaten the peace of the world. Iran hasn't shied away from military conflict. For most of the 1980s, Iran fought Iraq in a bitter border war. In 1988, the United States bombed Iran's navy and oil rigs in retaliation for Iranian attacks on oil tankers in the vital Gulf Straits. I don't think that any of us have a friendly feeling toward the people that have done what they have done. But Iran's influence has only grown since the 2003 US invasion of Iraq, spreading across its neighbour, cementing its support of Syria's Assad regime, as well as Hezbollah in southern Lebanon. In Yemen, it's fighting a proxy war against US ally Saudi Arabia. Another US ally, Israel, has repeatedly threatened to bomb Iran if it didn't stop its nuclear weapon ambitions. Jason Rezaian is a former Tehran bureau chief for the Washington Post who was held captive by the Iranian government. Now based in the US capital, he says America's allies in the Middle East are applying enormous pressure on President Trump. Saudi Arabia and Israel would like to see America do the dirty work. From their point of view, that's a wise approach. Iran does have the capability to disrupt um, both of those countries, to hurt both of those countries and create a lot of damage and, uh, and death along the way. But he says Iran's military has very clear limitations. What they don't have the ability to do is uh, do real damage to the United States of America on American soil. I think and I hope that there's a growing understanding that um, a conflict within Iran would have very real world ramifications for all of the countries in the neighborhood. Make sure that Iran doesn't have nuclear weapons. And your pursuit of nuclear weapons? Stop testing and proliferating ballistic missiles? That's the message to Tehran from the U.S. and Israel. Suspicion and accusation. But what's the reality? This is what we know. Iran has several nuclear sites, all monitored by the International Atomic Energy Agency, the world's nuclear watchdog. The IAEA says those facilities are peaceful and an important part of Iran's strategy to wean itself off gas and oil. World powers aren't really worried about Iran making nuclear energy per se. What they are worried about is Iran's ability to produce and stockpile highly enriched uranium, the stuff that's used to make the bomb. Not to get too deep into the science, but basically if you're making nuclear power, you're enriching uranium. But, and this is important, you're doing it at a much lower level than weapons grade. IAEA inspectors say Iran is keeping those levels low. Its February 2019 report says Iran doesn't have nearly enough uranium to make a bomb. Question is, how quickly could Iran change course? And does it even want to? That's a debate that's been going on for decades. In Iran's 1979 revolution, 
the new government inherited the country's nuclear program, developed by the deposed Shah with help from the U.S. It also inherited Iran's pledge to ban nuclear weapons under the Non-Proliferation Agreement. At first, the leadership cut the nuclear program altogether, saying it was un-Islamic. By the mid-1980s, the government brought it back. But for what purpose? The official line has always been, its nuclear program is for peaceful purposes only. The country's supreme leaders, the Ayatollahs, have always publicly opposed any weapon of mass destruction. As for the rest of the government, moderates tend to be on the side of limited civilian use as well as international cooperation. The conservatives lean more towards defiance and development. In the 1990s, moderate presidents Ali Akbar Hashemi Rafsanjani and Mohammad Khatami encouraged international cooperation and the government allowed IAEA inspections. But the U.S. was suspicious, convinced the energy program was a cover. It pressured countries against doing business with Iran's nuclear industry. In the year 2000, U.S. President Bill Clinton signed a law that allowed sanctions against anyone providing aid to Iran's program. By the mid-2000s, the moderates were losing. The new populist president, Mahmoud Ahmadinejad, praised the nuclear program and called for Israel to be wiped off the map. The country expanded its nuclear facilities and relations with IAEA inspectors turned sour. Other countries and the UN started announcing their own sanctions. Talks started and stalled. Things changed when moderate Hassan Rouhani won the presidency in 2013. Two years later, Iran signed on to what's known as the nuclear deal, the same one in place today. The joint comprehensive plan of action was struck between Iran and six world powers, the UK, France, China, Russia, Germany, and perhaps most importantly, the US. Under the deal, Iran agreed to cut the number of centrifuges, the tool used for uranium enrichment, by about two-thirds. It also promised to keep the uranium enrichment levels at 3.67%, way lower than the 90% needed for weapons grade, and slash its stockpile of low enriched uranium by 98%. In return, international sanctions were lifted. The deal seemed to be working until the U.S. voted in a new president. Never, ever, ever in my life have I seen any transaction so incompetently negotiated as our deal with Iran. And I mean never. After the U.S. backs out of an international nuclear agreement with Iran last year, relations between the two nations have been increasingly tense. They're a nation of terror and we won't put up with it. President Trump tightened sanctions last November and in April this year told countries that they too could face sanctions if they continued to buy oil from Iran. The U.S. moved this aircraft carrier into the region, the Abraham Lincoln. And what we are seeing now is an intensification of military activity in the area. In 2015, U.S. President Barack Obama backed an international deal to halt Tehran's nuclear enrichment program in exchange for lifting crippling economic sanctions. We give nothing up by testing whether or not this problem can be solved peacefully. Well, I was our lead negotiator on the Iran nuclear deal for a couple of years. It had very significant benefits. Sir Mark Lyle Grant went on to serve as the UK's ambassador to the UN, then became national security advisor to British PM David Cameron, who also endorsed the Iran nuclear deal. It did prevent Iran from acquiring nuclear weapons for at least a 12-year period. Nonetheless, uh, President Trump took the advice of those more hawkish uh, advisers and in 2018 pulled out of the deal. President Trump, I think, is gambling that maximum pressure on Iran will lead to uh, opposition to the regime and possibly a collapse of the regime. I don't think that's likely to happen and I think there is a risk of pushing Iran into a corner. Iran's president, Hassan Rouhani, today accused the United States of having an interventionist military presence, which he said was responsible for the Middle East's problems. I would say what uh, Iran is seeking here in order to come to the negotiating table is a dialing back of U.S. sanctions. And this is where there is distance between the, both sides. 
as the U.S. keeps putting more and more sanctions on Tehran, um, it's hard to see how um, the end game is going to come to fruition um, at, at a pace that we need it to. There are high-level representatives traveling to Tehran and impressing upon Iran to stay in the nuclear agreement and to keep tensions um, at a minimum. Um, at the same time, uh, without a bigger effort on behalf of uh, Europe, uh, they, they risk to make themselves irrelevant. President Trump's approach to Iran is in sharp contrast to his policy on North Korea, who revealed today that Kim Jong-un had received a personal letter from the US president. The Korean leader described it as excellent. Tomorrow, President Trump, who's on record as saying that lifting economic restraints would make Iran great again, is expected to announce a range of new sanctions against the regime in Tehran. Donald Trump pulled the U.S. out of the nuclear deal in May 2018 and reimposed sanctions. A year later, Iran made its own move. It said it would let stockpiles build up again, and even threatened to resume higher-level enrichment of uranium if its European partners don't keep their promises and fail to protect Iran from U.S. sanctions. Barjam has, Barjam pa barjas. اما اون روی سکه برجام را ما امروز نشان میدیم همون برجامی که به ما میگه در بند 26 و 36 که در صورت تخلف طرف متقابل شما هم میتوانید تعهدات خودتون را بکاهید The US reaction to that more sanctions more punishment for the people of Iran All evidence suggests that Iran isn't developing a nuclear weapon right now but with the future of the deal uncertain, it could still decide it needs one. And how fast could it make a nuclear bomb? Experts seem to agree, under current conditions, about a year. has warned tonight that within days it will breach the limit on its stockpile of enriched uranium, a central element of the Iran nuclear deal, but added there was still time for European countries to prevent this by providing protection from US sanctions. This was met by accusations of nuclear blackmail from the White House. It comes a year after the US President Donald Trump abandoned the nuclear deal himself, and at a time when tensions between the two countries are rising over attacks on oil tankers in the Persian Gulf. Here's our foreign affairs correspondent, Jonathan Rugman. It is a crisis which arguably began in Washington when President Trump labeled these Iranian Revolutionary Guards as terrorists back in April and tightened sanctions on their country. Then the Americans sent an aircraft carrier group and B-52 bombers to the Gulf, they said in response to an unspecified Iranian threat. Last month, President Rouhani announced that Iran was ramping up its nuclear fuel production, reducing its compliance with the deal that President Trump walked away from a year ago. And today, the Iranians chose one of their nuclear plants as the venue to announce that their supply of uranium will breach the deal's limit in 10 days' time. In what is a desperate bid to be allowed to sell oil, so desperate that a spokesman even delivered it in English. There will be another set of actions if, after 60 days, they will not uh, implement their commitments. We are suspending, we are not revoking the commitments, we are not removing the commitments. Iran's economy is being crippled by US sanctions as the Americans are threatening any company anywhere which trades with Iran. The Chinese say they will defy Washington and carry on buying oil, but the Europeans have tried and so far failed to bypass the Americans. Today they said they would keep trying, amid fears the nuclear deal will collapse. So our focus is not to enter into a blame game or uh, giving responsibility for uh, a collapse of a deal that might come. Our focus is to keep the agreement in place and keep uh, the implementation of it. When President Trump pulled out of the nuclear deal, his administration claimed that it had failed to stop the Iranians from testing missiles or supporting militants across the Middle East. Iran's response in the last few months has been typically defiant. One threat becomes reality. 
Iran has exceeded the limit of enriched uranium it's allowed to stockpile imposed by the 2015 nuclear deal. Iran has crossed the 300 kilogram limit. We were transparent in saying we were going to do this. Actions by the Europeans have not been enough, so the Islamic Republic is moving ahead with its plans, as we said we would. The United States, which has vowed to continue exerting pressure on Iran, said the move was an attempt to extort the international community. They know what they're doing, they know what they're playing with, and I think they're playing with fire. So no message to Iran whatsoever. Iran says, however, the decision is reversible as long as Europe offers relief from US sanctions. Several signatories of the 2015 deal and the UN have expressed alarm, but they don't have long to act. Iran has issued an ultimatum, giving Europe until July the 7th to provide sanctions relief and help Tehran sell its oil. Otherwise, they'll begin enriching uranium more highly, closer to a weapons-grade level. Iran says the country will continue to reduce its commitment to the 2015 nuclear deal every 60 days. The country's senior nuclear negotiator Abbas Arachi told reporters that this does not violate the terms of the pact. He said the EU was, has been given enough time to come up with new terms. Arachi also said the country's uranium enrichment will surpass the 3.6% limit set under the original deal for what its Busher nuclear power plant needs. Iran has previously said that was 5%. The negotiator also said the door for diplomacy is still open. Well, earlier I spoke to the former US foreign policy advisor, Vali Nasser, who's dean of the School of Advanced International Studies at Johns Hopkins University in Washington, DC. I asked him first how he reads Iran's decision to raise its nuclear threshold and breach the treaty. Well, I think Iran has been frustrated for a while that not only the United States left the deal, but other signatories are also not uh, complying with their obligations under the deal, which is to facilitate economic benefits for Iran. And I think it's a way of putting pressure on the Europeans, Chinese and the Russians and even the Americans not to take Iran's presence in the nuclear deal for granted but actually to actively try to work uh, for a way that he would get something from the deal to justify staying in it. In the meantime, given the tension surrounding this, uh, you've got a situation in the Gulf of Hormuz where there only has to be one more incident and more, one more determination by Donald Trump uh, that it is Iran who've done it, uh, that you can have a real flashpoint for war. That's exactly right. Uh, in other words, the, the president's, uh, President Trump's maximum pressure tactic has uh, the only thing is achieved is actually to bring the United States and Iran to the brink of war and also to bring the nuclear deal to the brink of collapse and I think the worst case scenario is an Iran that is in open conflict with the United States and the West and at the same time is no longer bound by obligations of the nuclear deal and may pursue a much more aggressive secret program and down the road become a much bigger threat to, uh, to, to regional powers as well as to Europe and the United States.